I have gotten word that there's a fire on our side of the river and it's moving pretty fast. And when we were here, it was still pretty clear that all of a sudden those trees just blew up in flames. The important thing at that point is who's still standing and how do we keep them standing? How close are they being to burn up? Firewatch 5-1, September 29th, 10-02 hours, and we're over the creek fire on the Sierra. Well, wait a minute. If lightning has started fires for millions of years, who put those fires out pre-1850? There was no fire department. When you've got hot, dry, windy conditions, which is what drives uh, the larger fires, and the larger fires make up almost all of the acreage that burns in a given year, that is overwhelmingly driven by climate and weather and therefore climate change. If that's the case, if we got climate change and this is getting drier and warmer and all that, shouldn't we manage the force more? Do we want to still have all these devastating fires? And what do you say to people that say, oh, it's just climate change? I don't think I can say that on camera, Jeff, because that would be bad words. Well, he sat there and he said, this will be the next big fire right here. He pointed, because none of this had burned yet. All of that had already burned. And he said, this will be the next big fire. And sure enough, it was. It's, it's hard to see coming up. We didn't see a lot of burned area, but the folks on the other side of the mountain, they did, and it's devastating. Too much fuel, too much brush, too much undergrowth, millions of dead trees that became torches. Well, the theory is once you've logged a forest over the years, you can't stop. I was not allowed to cut trees, no logging. I was told, you cannot log. They made me almost sign that with blood. And uh, that, of course, two months later, I started cutting trees. Now, I've always heard that the Forest Service had their hands tied by guys like you that wouldn't let them log beetle trees. Is that untrue? They're lying to you. Loggers know what the hell they're doing when it comes to cutting down trees. They're not cutting down green trees. They're cutting down dead trees. They're cutting down diseased trees. Yeah, it was a pretty devastating day. Uh, calling my wife and telling her was, yeah, I don't want to relive that. To my dying day, I will be on a platform advocating for good, healthy forest management. It's very, very sad. It, it just breaks my heart. The forest will never, ever in my lifetime return to what it was. Production funding for American Grown, My Job Depends on Ag, provided by James G. Parker Insurance Associates, insuring and protecting agribusiness for over 40 years. By Garv Bennett, the growing experts in water, irrigation, nutrition, and crop care advice and products. We help growers feed the world. By Golden State Farm Credit, building relationships with rural America by providing ag financial services. By Brandt, professional agriculture proudly supporting the heroes that work hard to feed a hungry world every day. By Unwired Broadband, today's internet for rural Central California, keeping Valley Agriculture connected since 2003. By Hodges Electric, proudly serving the Central Valley since 1979. And by Valley Air Conditioning and Repair, family owned for over 50 years, proudly featuring Coleman products, dedicated to supporting agriculture and the families that grow our nation's food. who run cattle on the other side of the river. So we knew there was a fire. My understanding was it had maybe, maybe had been a campfire that had gotten away from someone. And never, ever in my life would have thought that it would have jumped the river. Never seen anything like this in my life. And I've seen two fires come through and never experienced this kind of a fire. Just the speed in which it moved. It moved, it was fast, it was hot, and then not a lot you could do. From where I'm standing at camp, I can see mile high. 
like part of it. There's still a lot of trees, you can't see it very well, but I can see smoke coming over a mile high. And you know, 30 minutes ago, that smoke wasn't, wasn't there. So I told him, I said, hey, I'm seeing uh, smoke at mile high. At that time, he had told me, hey, I just talked to a really good friend of ours that runs cattle near over on Kaiser. And he told my husband to call me and say, get out now. Like I, he watched the fire from Kaiser like blow up and jump like miles and miles ahead. And he said, if there's anybody at Mount Pole, you need to tell them to get out of there right now. My neighbor, Gil Davis, uh, was sitting on his front porch and I asked him, Gil, uh, aren't you leaving? And he says, no, we don't have to. So we uh, flagged down the sheriff. The sheriff came over and got my name, my phone number, took my picture, asked me if I had any piercings, tattoos, scars or implants so they could identify my charred body. So uh -huh. that night, when you looked at it over the point, mm -hmm. you didn't sleep that night. You, you no, I, I immediately got assigned to the fire. And so I was there as a lookout. I helped direct the crews and I, I know the area well since I've uh, worked here for 30 years. And uh, so, you know, I, I helped get the crews into the fire. I did that till, oh, um, the crews got on site. And at that point, I, I switched into, you know, start to do some line scouting out for the uh, divisions, the uh, firefighters that were out uh, managing the fire. And so I was assisting them, assisting CAL FIRE in getting the dozers into the right spots and on the right road systems, getting gates open. Um, pretty much did that until about uh, 10, 30, 11 o'clock the next day. Saturday afternoon, um, I was down there hosing my backyard down and uh, I was watching three 400 foot flames go up uh, Sheep's Thief Creek. Um, it sounded like a jet engine. I was watching trees ignite before the flames even hit them because uh, uh, it was just so hot. So I'm a forest and fire ecologist. I have a PhD in ecology from UC Davis, and uh, I do research on wildland fires, essentially, how they burn, what happens after they burn. Uh, I'm the director of the John Muir Project, and we're a small nonprofit uh, forest conservation and research organization. If a fire is close to a community, we should try to put it out if it can be put out. So in other words, if the fire weather is low, which is the only time a fire actually can be suppressed. But out in the forest, we actually have less fire now than we had historically, more than a century ago, before fire suppression. We have less fire in our forests than we had for centuries and centuries, for thousands and thousands of years, before we started putting out fires a century ago. And so it's important to understand that because what it means is, is that when fires occur, including big fires, it's not a destructive event out in the forest. It's actually a restorative event. It's ecological restoration. I so believe in good forest management that we humans are responsible for our forests. Uh, yes, we have messed that up and it's our responsibility now to fix it uh, before we have more of the, like the creek fire and the, the uh, bark beetle infestation. My, my academic training in forestry was strictly grow more fiber. Uh, in those days, the whole of forestry across the entire United States was focused on producing more wood because we were still growing after the Second World War. We were building houses like crazy, cutting down trees. So my whole education was based on growing wood faster. A lot of people assume that forests with a lot of dead trees uh, and a lot of down logs will burn much more intensely because they assume that basically that's fuel, right? That's, that's, the, that's the prevailing assumption. And in fact, it made so much sense to so many people for so long that no one bothered to test that scientifically. Here's what it comes down to. It's really just a matter of physics. When trees die, very, very soon after they die, the, the dead needles and the small twigs, they fall and they decay into the soil. And after that happens, what you have there is basically something that doesn't have much left that, to carry the flames. There's not much kindling on the dead tree to actually make it burn and contribute to fire intensity. What people don't realize is that that mature dead tree in the forest, it's kind of like that big log on the campfire. There's just not much kindling to carry the flames. And then interestingly, when they fall, 
When they're on the ground on the forest floor, they actually soak up and retain huge amounts of soil moisture. You will hear people say that dead trees did not, uh, would not uh, increase the fire risk or fire hazard. Hogwash. The reason we have mega fires now is strictly fuel. Not only do those dead trees burn faster and hotter than green trees, they throw off huge chunks of fuel. And we picked up chunks of burned bark and, and parts of trees that were, had been dead that would, they fall, you know, chunks fall apart all over this property here in the museum. This fire jumped because of those dead trees and jumped is in one uh, incident, eight miles. This is the third time mom has been evacuated, either from her home or from our cabin. And you learn to deal with it. I'm not saying it gets easier, but you figure out what you have to do. And mom actually had a list on her phone of things that we needed to grab from up here if we ever had to come and get evacuated. So she took the inside, I took the outside, and we started grabbing things. And these two old ladies loaded that truck so fast we got it done. Are we only half alive? Embers drifting in the night. Looking, wandering all the time. We see the kingdom. So the Creek Fire uh, started on Friday night out near out near Big Creek, um, and it was fairly small, got up into the tens of acres. By the morning, it was in the hundreds. By the next morning, it was in the thousands or tens of thousands, I forget. Um, that by Saturday night, it was beyond expectations for us. I have a lot of animals. I had three horses. Between my friend and I, we had eight or nine dogs. Um, and I had my, kid, my son with me. I was trying to prepare my animals. I knew there was places we could go to be safe for a fire. I just wanted to make sure I had all my animals, that they were gonna be safe. When it came through our community, we have been training for it to come up the mountain uh, from below. And because that is always the, the wisdom is said that this is where it would come from. The night of the fire, um, when it was coming close to our, when it burned through our community, I was above it because that's where the fire was that night. And that's where we were expecting to see it come through. And it didn't, it came across the highway over the side where nobody expected it to come through. Sitting at the store with my dad and my aunt's like, okay, I need to go tell some people to leave. And we're like, okay. She backed up in her side by side and went up on top of a hill, not a very big hill. and she, just enough to kind of look out and see. And she could see that the fire had jumped to Sweetwater. So there goes our road out. The fire's in front of us and the fire's behind us. So she's like, all right, I'm going to tell people right now. She, there was no way to drive out. At that point, it's everybody to get to the lake. And so from that moment, my dad and I jumped in the side by side. My son was back at my cow camp with, um, with my friend. And as we were driving out our campground, Right before you go to cross the bridge, there's like a, a little camp spot right there. That camp was on fire. And there was kids running around screaming. I mean, didn't, nobody knew, no one, those people had no idea there was even a fire. We were out there. We were, we drove, because my dad said, get, go out in the meadow, it's, it's grass, you know, it'll be fine. And so Peter and I were sitting right there, pretty much where that little black spot is. And I'm, I'm like, we can't stay here. We can't stay in this spot. Um, because of the smoke and then there's flames everywhere. And when, I, when you came back, my dad came back and saw us, so we need to get to the pond. And from right there to get to here, I couldn't see, you could not see. You couldn't see from, from that here, black space no, to right here. here. It was so smoky. Well, And I knew there was a tree and a rock, but I didn't know exactly after, where I was. After that blew up, this mountain started on fire. Like oh, five yeah. or six spots all around us. And probably within 20, 30 minutes, the winds kicked up. I and mean, that's 50, when that 60 mile an winds. And they, they were blowing that hard. It sounded like a freight train going through.
Well, I mean, I've been concerned for a long time. So, uh, you know, my day job is as a forester. Uh, I have, um, you know, responsibilities across California, but uh, my home base is here on the Sierra National Forest. So, uh, since the drought uh, and the bug kill, uh, you know, in 2016, uh, I was super concerned about what might happen with a fire uh, in this particular canyon. And so the, the, the National Forest here, the Sierra National Forest, uh, initiated a project called the Music Project, which was designed to prevent this very project. And actually, the day before this fire started, the contract period for this project closed. And so that, that you know, that project was, uh, came about because of all the hundreds of tons of fuel of the hundreds and millions of dead trees that were in this canyon. And so, yeah, super concerned about what might happen. Um, you know, pretty much it gamed out what might happen uh, in terms of a worst case scenario. And this far exceeded <laughs> any of those uh, scenarios. We cannot let political lines on a map or historic political parties' points of view on this because we know the answer is right in front of our eyes. I've been uh, uh, across, uh, I've seen the West. I've seen almost every national forest in the West, if not every national forest. And this is by far the most pretty national forest. Even burnt, it's gonna be pretty. <laughs> you know, uh, it has tremendous views. It's got the granite. It's just, you, you develop an emotional connection with it and it, it here, gets here. you. There is the suggestion that there be uh, logging and forest wood products that come back. When you manage the forests with sustainable logging, there is a resource of money that can come back to the, those communities and come back to those forests and come back to those uh, operations that not only hire people, but have the resources to do an awful lot of the kind of cleanup and the mm -hmm. management that w within those forests. You know, in those days we had a bank, we had a uh, drugstore, we had two doctors, two dentists, about five or six bars, three grocery stores. All in North Fork. All in North Fork, right in the middle of North Fork, you know. And uh, when, when the mill shut down in 93, we lost so much. And then I was on the school board then. We also lost uh, uh, about a third of our kids and, and about a third of our teachers because we couldn't keep the teachers on. So it was a hard time hit for North Fork and we still haven't really caught up. They, they had done all this study about how many board feet were cut, how many were growing, and how many died from natural and stuff. So they, that mill averaged about 100 million, 92 to 100 million board feet a year. Just North Fork Mill. And they, uh, the biggest year was 132 million board feet. And uh, in that study, they said that the forest was growing, now get this, growing every year about 130 million board feet and natural death from bugs, you know, diseases, old age, or what have you, 70 million were dying. So when they were cutting 92 to 100 million board feet, it was kind of like a balance. It kept the forest balanced. There is a strong and emerging consensus among climate scientists and ecologists in this country and around the world that we need to start shifting away from logging and wood products to mitigate the climate crisis, just as we're shifting away from fossil fuel consumption. What we know now is um, that logging is one of the largest sources of carbon emissions into the atmosphere. And it's a huge, huge contributing factor in the climate crisis. When the creek fire uh, went roaring up out of Big Creek Canyon onto Edison lands, uh, it hit an, <laughs> uh, an adversary to fire, and that is there was no fuel. I had prescribed fire, uh, burned it uh, for years, the first time in, in the 80s. Uh, so there was a tremendous fuel reduction. And the fire ran up there and lo and behold, it stopped because there was no fuel. It wasn't that the climate change was on one side of the property line and the climate change wasn't on the other side of the line. It was strictly fuel. The winds were blowing on both sides of the property line, all that stuff. So the fire came up and just, in essence, laid down, jumped over 
the, the lands that Edison had been managing with prescribed fire and logging. We had thinned those th uh, areas over the years several times, uh, thinned it out so there was way less fuel than on uh, national forest lands. In the, in the incidents where it's roaring other places, the Big Creek Fire is going like crazy up the canyon, uh, across Crestman's, it just was burning like a prescribed fire on Edison lands. Mainly, well, strictly, not mainly, strictly because of the amount of fuel. big wind event, Mona wind event, and we're going to go check out the Bayshore cabins just to make sure that uh, no big trees fell on it, is what the plan is. Now we did hear that a lot of trees went down here at Bass Lake, and we know there's a lot of trees down on Bayshore Road that we're going up right now. Correct, correct. So uh, we survived the, the largest forest fire in history, and hopefully we'll survive the uh, Mona wind event. Big old black oak. I didn't know what to expect. I know we have some giant fir trees, you know, pretty, you know, could be 48 inch, could be a 60 inch fir tree, but that would probably stop us. But uh, these small ones shouldn't be a problem. You think I could pull all the way here, Johnny? Yeah, so we're just moving down Bayshore Road, uh, heading to the cabin uh, to survey the damage. We're obviously the first ones in because uh, no one's been here before. We're, we're trail breaking right now. Um, and you never know, it could be around the corner and get in another one of these big red firs that are 30 plus inches in diameter and then that's gonna slow us down a little bit. But this is a sign of how much material was knocked down by this recent Mona wind event, and uh, we're just looking at one little area that we can see. This one, this Mona wind event hit the entire forest, the Sierra National Forest, and more. And so uh, we're talking about tons per acre of material that's down on the ground because of this event. That could be fuel for future fires. How about we do one at a time, people? Yeah. People. Get this, I'll do this one. You know, one of the things that occurred to me as we were shooting this episode and listening to people like Chad Hansen and then Tom Wheeler and John Mount is that it's possible that both sides of this debate are, are right. You're talking about climate change. Climate change is the weather. The weather is gonna make it hotter and drier, which is gonna make fire behavior more active. The fire can't burn unless it has fuel. And so we still need to sort out some of these theories about fuel removal and cleaning out a forest if that makes forest fires burn hotter or not. If you come into a forest and do logging and thin the forest out, aren't you limiting the amount of trees that can drop a lot of this stuff? A lot of these trees have never been, this area has been, never been logged. And so you have a lot of dead branches and you have a lot of uh, material that just falls out of these older dead trees. And they add to ground litter, which adds fuel to the forest that could burn later. So it's an interesting debate. And it's one that's not gonna go away anytime soon, I'm afraid. Um, but we all gotta wrap our heads around it, I know that. Production funding for American Grown, My Job Depends on Ag, provided by James G. Parker Insurance Associates.
insuring and protecting agribusiness for over 40 years by Garv Bennett, the growing experts in water, irrigation, nutrition, and crop care advice and products. We help growers feed the world by Golden State Farm Credit, building relationships with rural America by providing ag financial services by Brandt, professional agriculture, proudly supporting the heroes that work hard to feed a hungry world every day by Unwired Broadband, today's internet for rural Central California, keeping Valley Agriculture connected since 2003. By Hodges Electric, proudly serving the Central Valley since 1979. And by Valley Air Conditioning and Repair, family owned for over 50 years, proudly featuring Coleman products, dedicated to supporting agriculture and the families that grow our nation's food.